Hi, everyone. Welcome to um, our first virtual meeting for the UBC Migration Mobilities Group. Um, my name is Gao Han Zhang, and I'm an assistant professor of Italian studies at UBC. And I'm also the uh, group leader for the Mobilities Group. So I'd like to start by introducing our group and UBC Migration very briefly. Um, the um, Mobilities Group um, is a group of scholars who are interested in humanistic, interpretive, multilingual, and culturally sensitive scholarship on multiple and intersecting mobilities. So an example from uh, my own research would be um, the Italian film Terra Ferma by um, director Emanuele Crialese, where he shows refugees being forced to land on the Sicilian island as Italian tourists from the northern part of the country go there for vacations. So that's an example of how um, primary texts speak to intersection, intersecting and multiple mobilities. And in the past years, um, for our group, we have brought speakers working on migration and mobility issues. Uh, including historians such as Donna Gabacha and Luz Benguiat, uh, cinema studies professors such as uh, Aina O'Healy, and last year also geographer Tim Cresswell. And this year, we will be having uh, five speakers from outside of UBC who will be speaking about issues relating to mobilities in various disciplines and from various perspectives. The um, migration, UBC migration, um, sorry, our group is under the auspices of UBC migration. And UBC migration is a hub at the university where uh, we seek to understand and engage in debate about the drivers and consequences of international migration through research, education, and outreach. And uh, I must say that uh, this, uh, our clusters meetings are the meetings that I'm really looking forward to each time because I think they're very well managed and all the people on the committee uh, are very engaged in uh, fostering this new initiative. And our two co-leaders, Antia Aleman and Suzanne Hoet, are extremely driven and I'm very happy to be part of it. I'd like to thank our co-sponsor, for this event. Um, the co-sponsor is UBC Latin American Studies Program. And I would like to thank its chair, Alessandra Santos, for uh, accepting our proposal to uh, co-sponsor this uh, event. I would also like to thank uh, Douglas Ober, the research coordinator of UBC Migration, for helping us manage and set up the various um, logistical things about these lectures, and also Dustin Gray for making posters for us. At this point, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered today on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Maskin people. I'd like to remind the attendees that um, our event is being recorded as we speak but our Q&A after the talk will not be recorded. Um, I will also um, uh, mention that the uh, participants will be able to ask questions anonymously during the Q&A session. And um, right after the talk is over, um, someone will uh, explain in greater detail um, on how uh, this lecture, uh, on how to use the chat box to ask questions. So um, Han Fei, who is uh, our uh, coordinator for, for the mobility group, will explain uh, to you later on. Okay, now uh, I would like to introduce our speaker in detail. So our speaker Mimi Scheller is professor of sociology head of the sociology department and founding director of the Center for Mobilities Research and Policy at Drexel University in Philadelphia. She is founding co-editor of the journal titled Mobilities, 
and past president of the International Association for the History of Transport, Traffic, and Mobility. She is author or co-editor of 12 books, including Island Futures, Caribbean Survival in the Anthropocene, which was um, which just came out this year from Duke University Press. Just Mobility Justice, the Politics of Movement in an Age of Extremes. Aluminum Dreams, the Making of Light Modernity. Citizenship from Below, Erotic Agency and Caribbean Freedom. Consuming the Caribbean from Arawaks to Zombies. And Democracy After Slavery, Black Publics and Peasant Radicalism in Haiti and Jamaica. Dr. Scheller is considered to be a key theorist in mobility studies and specializes in the post-colonial context of the Caribbean. In fact, at the, in, the, in the first year when uh, we formed the group on mobilities, we read the article that she and John Uri wrote for um, sort of a manifesto of the mobility studies in order to uh, further our own understandings of it. As co-editor with John Uri of the journal Mobilities and the books Tourism, Mobilities, and Mobile Technologies of the City, and author of numerous highly cited articles, she helped to establish the new interdisciplinary field of mobilities research. She was awarded the Dr. Honoris Causa from Haskell University in Denmark. She has received research funding from the National Science Foundation, the British Academy, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, the MacArthur Foundation, the Mobile Lives Forum, the Graham Foundation in Advanced Studies in Fine Arts, she has also held visiting fellowships at the University of Miami, the Annenberg School of Communication at the University of Pennsylvania, the Pan Humanities Forum, the Center for Mobility and Urban Studies at Aalborg University in Denmark, Media and McGill University in Canada, the Davis Center for Historical Studies at Princeton University, and Swarthmore College. So I'm sure that the UBC intellectual community like me is very pleased to have Dr. Scheller here today with us remotely, virtually, to deliver a talk that is titled Mobility, Justice, Climate Migration, and the Lessons of Pandemic, Mobilities, and Immobilities. So I would like to um, welcome, warmly welcome Dr. Scheller to join us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, and thanks to UBC Migration and UBC Latin American Studies um, for the invitation to be with you today. Can everyone see and hear me? Just checking and yes, okay. So um, I'm gonna begin just to say a few things about the cover of my book, which will be out in November, Island Futures. And the cover is a painting by the Haitian artist, Edouard Duval Carrier. And um, for me, it's just a beautiful representation of the history of uh, islands and the people of the Caribbean, and in particular, Haiti, and what this represents for their future, um, the threats of climate change and survival in the Anthropocene, which is the subtitle of the book. And the the tree is um, on, the, on the boat with the sort of ancestral spirits kind of looking, I think, for a home, right? Trying to find a mooring. And in mobilities research, we talk about mobilities, immobilities, and moorings. And the boat is also a reminder to me that we, we are all connected um, across the sea. So across the archipelagos of the Caribbean, but also up uh, to where I am um, in, um, in the, ancestral territories of the Lene Lenape peoples. And I spent the summer in Maine um, in the territory of the Wabanaki people. And these archipelagos have been connected and remain connected in many ways. And that's part of what I wanna talk about today. So 
Let me begin with just a quick outline of my talk. And I want to speak first about mobility justice and climate migration. And in fact, give something of a critique of that term. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll turn to pandemic immobilities and mobilities. So the first part draws somewhat on my previous work. The section on pandemic immobilities and mobilities is new because um, I've only just been able to think about that this summer. And then in the third part, I'll try to bring together the lessons of climate mobilities and COVID-19 mobilities and through the lens of mobility justice. So part one, mobility justice and climate migration. And here I'm drawing on my book um, from 2018, Mobility Justice, The Politics of Movement in an Age of Extremes. And here I argue that a more robust and comprehensive and mobile theory of mobility justice can help us address the combined crises of climate change, unsustainable urban mobilities, that is the need for sort of low carbon transitions, and also the current border issues around what I think of as a kind of crackdown on transnational migrations of many kinds that are happening in these kind of reactionary movements all around the world, but especially here where I am in the United States. So mobility justice as a concept is meant to sort of unsettle our more sedentary notions of justice and where it is seated, where it is found, where, where we um, kind of establish it. And I think of mobility justice as a process of emergent relationships involving an interplay of diverse mobilities and immobilities. And I, I use that phrase with a sort of parentheses around the I am at the beginning to remind us that mobilities and immobilities are always entangled with each other. They're kind of co-constituted. So mobility justice moves across scales. It moves from um, relations of the body um, and interpersonal relations, um, sexuality, gender, and, and race, and ability, and disability, and age, and, and other attributes that are placed on our bodies and affect our mobilities. And it moves across um, the level of kind of streets and cities and infrastructure, and then to borders and nations and um, through what I call planetary mobilities as well. And at the same time, it also moves across different uh, kind of modes of justice or ways of, of thinking about justice. And so I see it as involving different elements of distributive ju justice, deliberative justice, procedural justice, restorative justice, and epistemic justice. And I won't have time to unpack all of that today, um, but that's kind of part of the arguments within that book on mobility justice. Um, some colleagues have written that the concept of mobility justice is powerful precisely because it positions capitalism along with its fossil fueled infrastructures of air travel, automobility, suburbanization, and consumerism at the very center of the concern about climate change and displacement. So that's how it links to questions about um, climate mi and migration. So what do I mean by climate? Um, mobilities. And I'll use the term climate mobilities instead of climate migration because um, it helps put it in a, in a different perspective. Mobilities, you could say, are governed by mobility regimes that determine who and what can move or stay put, when, where, how, and under what conditions. Mobilities are also not just about sort of physical movement, but are also about meanings, values, forms of justification, stories, um, legitimations. They are, as Tim Cresswell puts it, constellations. And they involve, involve um, all mobilities involve material and symbolic aspects um, that are sort of embodied as uh, in the acts of, of movement. So to give an example of that, we could look at how the term climate refugees carries these meanings and these um, associations with it it has been negatively appropriated into discourses that drive a fear of refugees who are said to be flooding our shores. In that sense, it exacerbates the reactionary politics of wall building and abandonment of people um, who are trying to cross borders. And 
climate migration has also been used within um, security discourses and sort of concerns about um, you know how the um, wealthier countries of the global north will deal with climate migration coming from the global south. So uh, following Baldwin et al, we can instead use the concept of mobility justice to recharacterize those displaced by climate change, not as climate refugees, but as displacees of a globalized network of intersecting mobility regimes um, that are fueled by fossil fuel extraction. And so it kind of puts the responsibility back on the producers and consumers of fossil fuel. Um, so these are sort of typical images that we see in the media of uh, climate refugees of some kind or climate displacees. Um, we see a tent camp in La Paz, Bolivia, where people were displaced by landslides. We see food being handed out in um, Mogadishu. Uh, we see flooding, uh, I believe that might be Bangladesh. And we see people in a, um, a railway station in Calcutta, um, again, displaced by a cyclone. Um, and these are actually all, in a way, images of internal uh, refugees, which of course isn't a term for internal displacement, but internally displaced people. But these are the kinds of images that are used to kind of put fear in, into the global north about what will happen when all these people are, are sort of leaving their shores and coming here. So to avoid that kind of framing of the issue, that kind of symbolic meaning around those mobilities, let's talk instead about climate debt. Those of us in the industrialized regions of the global north, especially the wealthiest 10%, consume more energy and more fossil fuel than most people in the world. The group who I refer to as the kinetic elite, those with high motility, meaning they have high um, potential options, many different options of how to be mobile, when and where, and they can also mobilize labor and goods to come to them so they don't have to move, that's high motility. That kinetic elite generally have high energy lifestyles that are uh, responsible for excessive carbon emissions causing climate change and, cl and climate displacement around the world. Um, let me go back a second. So by understanding climate displacement as something driven by our fossil fueled way of life in the global north, we can begin on a very different footing to discuss this reception of climate migrants or this problem of, of climate refugees. And you might have seen visualizations like this of um, from the Global Carbon Project and the um, Carbon Dioxide Analysis Center asking who has contributed most to global CO2 emissions. And this is um, an image showing cumulative carbon dioxide emissions from the period 1751 up until more or less the present. And you see, of course, the USA has contributed 25% of global cumulative emissions, the EU 22%, China 12.7%, and so on. Um, Canada's up there with 2%. Um, so, you know, this is one way to think about uh, carbon debt. The, the em emitters are the debtors, and the countries that and places that have, you know, emitted the least carbon um, are owed something in return. And of course, this is using a kind of national framing. And even we know, of course, within nations, there's huge inequalities and disparities there. But that kind of carbon accounting, and the way in which it it links to thinking about uh, climate debt is, for me, an important aspect of thinking about what we call the no borders movement. And a no borders perspective insists that people should not be categorized through inherently exclusionary state forms of identification, such as migrant or citizen, in ways that punish non-citizens. So the, the argument is that citizenship should not be the basis for receiving social protection of some kind, and that non-citizens can therefore be, you know, expelled and sent to death, basically, left to die in the deserts or in the oceans. Advocates say that a no borders perspective argues for demolishing any kind of citizenship categorization 
used as a precondition of social protection and relatedly for being social. So the, the idea is that we need to have systems and forms of social protection and acknowledgement of, of human rights that do not rely simply on citizenship. And in a way, this is a, a strong rejection of the taken for granted monopoly of states to control human mobility in ways that ultimately cause harm through exclusion. It implies a radical right to human freedom of movement. And um, I draw on the work of Joseph Karens and Reese Jones on violent borders to kind of look at some of these issues around the right to move. Um, but I, I believe that the climate debtor nations have a particular responsibility to take in those who are displaced by climate change. And that lies behind, um, in the book Mobility Justice, I talk um, about different types of principles of mobility justice. And this set of principles uh, displayed here are the ones concerning movement across borders. There's other ones that concern movement within streets and cities and relations between um, embodied actors and also ones relating to other kinds of uh, scales. But here, Many of these are the basic existing UN conventions, right? That all people shall enjoy a right to exit and re-enter the territory from which they originate. There's a right to freedom of movement across borders for tourism, education, temporary work. No one should be detained or deported without due process. There's a right to refuge for those fleeing violence, persecution, and loss of domicile by war, and so on. But I add to this, uh, one that does not yet exist, which is that people displaced by climate change shall have a right to resettlement in other countries, especially in those countries that contributed most um, to, to climate destabilization. So this is a way to think about what are the existing kind of rights governing movement across borders, how can we extend those, and how can we um, protect people from, from um, exclusion and um, the, the increasing sort of violation that's happening of these basic principles. So that brings me then to part two and thinking about pandemic immobilities. So how does the pandemic come into play in this situation um, and what's happened in terms of mobilities and immobilities over the last six months? So the first thing is that I think of COVID-19 um, pandemic as a global mobility disruption. And of course, we're all now familiar with the many demobilizations that have occurred as countries have gone into lockdown and tried to prevent the spread of the virus. So many people had to stop going out to work unless it was deemed essential work. Many others were sent back to home countries or rural villages, other places where they had come from. Children had to be kept home from school, universities were closed, many businesses closed their doors and others had to reorganize their work processes. Airplanes stopped flying, airports emptied, cruise ships were turned away from ports as borders closed, factories stopped churning out goods and global shipments temporarily slowed to a trickle and for a while there, fossil fuel prices plummeted and supplies had to be stored on tankers at sea. Those were some of the kind of demobilizations. But then there was also a whole set of remobilizations and new mobilities that had to occur. So we saw evacuations and repatriations of um, travelers returning from abroad. We saw essential workers having to find ways of you know, getting to and from their jobs. We saw this idea of open streets, um, so new mobilities of streets being um, open for bicycling and walking uh, and streeteries. And we saw local communities conducting um, different kinds of drive up or sometimes bike and walk up activities, although often not, such as virus testing and food distribution, new kinds of logistical processes and expansions of online mobilities such as telemedicine. So this great global mobility disruption occurred. And within that, if we focus on what happened in terms of migration, there was an incredible disruption of the normal uh, conventions and laws governing refugee reception and migration. So in the United States, the COVID-19 crisis allowed the Trump administration 
to use it as a public health justification to immediately expel people showing up at the border. And, um, you know, Central Americans who had been coming into the US and already were facing blockage um, of what were called the caravans were just completely shut off and forced to stay in Mexico. And, and in other cases, people um, continued to be deported to life-threatening circumstances or were themselves carrying the virus while and when they were deported by the US. When the government of India shut down cities during the pandemic, millions of people were forced to walk home to their villages hundreds of miles away, and again, possibly carrying the virus with them. And in the European Union, we see this anti-humanitarian pushback against the rescue of migrants at sea in the Mediterranean with the blocking of rescue ships. And in some cases, um, as Charles Heller has reported in recent um, work he's been writing, that people um, you know, were put onto these soggy inflatable rafts and they were like pushed back towards Turkey. Um, and, and in some cases, people died in that situation. So the war on the virus is described by Charles Heller as justifying um, a war on migrants. According to the International Organization for Migration, by April 2020, more than 130 countries had introduced entry restrictions at their borders with especially severe effects for refugees and migrants who were fleeing danger. And the Migration Policy Institute argues um, crossing an international border to a country of safety and filing an asylum claim is no longer possible in many places a seismic shock to the foundations of a post-World War II international protection system that relies on the goodwill of national governments to grant access to their territory for those in need. So we're seeing the kind of practices that emerged in the post-war period through the United Nations, um, conventions on refugees and so on, falling apart, right? They're, they're no longer being respected. So the closing of borders due to the pandemic has intensified existing processes of closure and expulsion with especially detrimental outcomes for the most vulnerable forced migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, and repatriated deportees. As Mizandro and Steele have argued in Open Democracy, during the pandemic, migrants embody the harshest way the con contradictions and tensions surrounding the freedom of movement and its denial today. It is not surprising that in the current climate, it is migrants who tend to become one of the first targets of the most restrictive measures. Um, and picking up on earlier work by Saracen, you can argue that here also lies the historical reality of the continued treatment of the diseased as foreign bodies through an often racialized phantasmagoric representation that treats the sick body of an individual as an intruding threat to the supposedly healthy national body. And as we know, the, you know, the irony here is that the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus was already inside many countries at the time that they finally closed their borders, in particular the United States, which um, you know, managed to close borders kind of after the virus was already here. And we see the results now with more than 200,000 deaths. So this great expulsion of people is a harbinger of what might come in the future with climate change, and really now already, as governments seek new ways to manage mobile populations affected by drought, famine, or flooding. The, the pandemic has also brought the prospect of biometric surveillance biophysical testing regimes to pass through borders, self-registration into contact tracing technologies, and the idea of some kind of immunity passport that would potentially be registered into a global database for tracking of mobilities, um, although that may not be scientifically possible. But in, these are the kinds of imaginaries that are, are, are being um, sort of in, entrenched with, with the idea of how will we manage uh, the, the future of this kind of pandemic that might become endemic, right? We're not sure we can actually um, stop it. So there is a management of mobilities, as William Waters, Walters had written, not a generalized immobilization, but a strategic application of immobility to specific cases coupled with the production of certain kinds of mobility. 
So let me move then to the third part of my talk and consider the lessons of climate migration and COVID-19 mobilities as I try to bring them together. So we know that in the Anthropocene, there is a racially uneven vulnerability and death. Um, that's a, a term, that's a description used by Linda Pulido, but many others have written about this idea. Um, and this is an a photograph of an aftermath of um, Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas, uh, that some groups are more, more vulnerable than others. And this idea of the Anthropocene is um, too generalized um, in terms of both who has caused it. It is not just man who has caused it, mankind, but it's specific um, forms of capitalist fossil fuel extraction and um, uh, con contribution to global warming. And those who are most vulnerable to it um, are also unevenly distributed. As Yarimar Bonilla, has, uh, the port anthropologist of Puerto Rico, um, who has written about hurricanes Irma and Maria, she says vulnerability is not simply a product of natural conditions, it is a political state and a colonial condition. And COVID-19 has thrived upon these human vulnerabilities. And it, its spread is also a product of political relations and colonial conditions. That is forms of racialization, um, of exclusion of uh, undocumented immigrants and of various other kinds of migrant groups from access to various kinds of healthcare and information. And that's part of why the Black Lives Matter movement has reignited not only in the US but around the world during this time to recognition that this isn't just a, a sort of generic health crisis affecting all people, but that it's uneven and it's a political state and a colonial condition that exacerbates it. So we've entered a new era of heavily controlled movement governed by racialized security regimes, bio-governance, and a kind of extreme kinopolitics of nationalism, bordering, and expulsion. And by kinopolitics, I refer to um, the idea of mobility politics, the politics of mobility and the forms of, of mobility regimes and governing of mobility and struggles over mobility as crucial to uh, a, a kind of formation of political subjects and, and political actions. So, this is um, another example from the Caribbean um, where uh, Angelique Nixon has written about Hurricane Dorian in 2019. And what I want to emphasize here is that these kinopolitical struggles are not just between you know, the, the, the global north and the global south, or they're, it's not just about the, the big powerful countries excluding people, but that it um, sort of is fractally produced across the world. So Haitian migrants and Haitian Bahamians in the Bahamas were one of the most vulnerable and marginalized communities. And the many undocumented Haitian migrants in Abaco, where Hurricane Dorian wiped out um, entire uh, townships, might have been fearful to seek shelter in the storm, even with a mandatory evacuation. And it's likely that we may never know for sure how many in this community lost their lives. And uh, inset on this picture is um, a screenshot of a, an announcement that came out from um, uh, for a, a, a group called Operation Sovereign Bahamas. And the topic was eradicating illegal immigrants in the Bahamas, shanty towns down. And this was held at the Church of God of Prophecy. And so this kind of anti-immigrant uh, rhetoric is um, not just happening in the United States uh, uh, and, and, uh, or in Europe. It's um, spreading in many, many places. So in terms of the intersection of the climate crisis and the COVID-19 crisis, what responsibility do we in the US or the EU, or we could add Canada, what responsibility do we bear as some of the largest emitters of greenhouse gases and beneficiaries of fossil fuel production and consumption, as well as our role in colonialism, slavery, and resource extraction around the world. And what does this have to do with the disrupted mobilities of the pandemic? 
Can a mobility justice approach help us understand and address the uneven impacts of both climate change and COVID-19? And would greater mobility justice help solve both crises? So my argument is that um, if we look at the impacts, there is a direct relation between what I talked about in terms of climate migrants and what we talk about in terms of the uneven impacts of COVID-19. So the Migration Policy Institute estimates that 6 million immigrants in the USA, which includes both documented and undocumented workers, are in essential jobs such as farm employees, grocery store clerks, delivery truck drivers, meat plant workers, etc., who we have seen are disproportionately at risk of exposure to SARS-CoV-2. Necessary to the food system are not only immigrant food processing workers, but also the 257,000 temporary H-2A visa workers, mainly from Central America and the Caribbean, who are still needed to travel from region to region following the ripening crop seasons, yet have no right to remain. And I would add that they follow those crops from Florida up the East Coast and to Canada. These field workers have been told to keep working despite stay at home directives and given letters attesting to their critical role in feeding the country. So they're designated essential workers, even when they have little access to health care, no sick leave, no financial relief, and often very poor housing and conditions in which they're living. At the same time, the total of 11 million undocumented immigrants in the US in general are also at high risk of contracting the virus. So if we turn to a climate justice approach, uh, Malini Ranganathan and Eve Bratman have written about the idea of abolition democracy, an approach to climate justice rooted in abolitionism, one that seeks to address racism and climate-induced harm together. Just as W.E.B. Du Bois's notion of abolition democracy was attentive to the interconnected spheres that were and are necessary to achieve unfinished black emancipation after the end of slavery, an abolitionist approach to climate justice demands attention to historical reparations and intersectional processes that are not solely associated with climate. That is things like housing, policing, and food security. Hence the Black Lives Matter movement. And, and then they also argue that an emphasis on reparative humanism reminds us that environmental harm often proceeds via dehumanization. As such, an anti-racist humanist approach to climate praxis embeds narratives of healing from historical trauma. It embraces intersectional thinking, making unlikely connections between spheres. And I would elaborate on that by saying the same goes for COVID-19 and that there is this connection between these spheres of climate praxis and uh, viral praxis and that they're interconnected and it's through uneven mobilities and immobilities that we see that um, connection. So just to sort of bring this to a conclusion and, and to open up a discussion with all of you, um, I've, I've, I'm working towards a new project on um, thinking about mobile commons and commoning mobilities and I I wouldn't be able to fully um, flesh it out right now, it's in progress, but in, in general, I wanna conclude by saying that a holistic theory of mobility justice, this kind of multi-scalar mobile ontology of mobility justice can help us perceive the connections across these different regimes of mobility. Um, you know, the, the regimes of mobility governing cr border crossing and migration, refugee resettlement, um, the regimes of mobility concerning driving while black and uh, policing of our city streets, the regimes of mobility involving um, workers and labor migration and the production and food and the circulation of goods, all of these um, need to be connected through a mobility justice lens. And as Wainwright and Mann argue in their book, Climate Leviathan, we need a robust political language defending the right of people to migrate in anticipation of climate change. But we also must defend the right to dwell, to restore place, to share commons, and to the right to reparative justice. If we build fortress cities and heavily bordered societies as we seem to be heading towards, we will always 
be tempted to externalize environmental harms and expel the unwanted to the sacrifice zones outside our borders. So it will never be sustainable. Um, economic stimulus, which is being suggested to pull us out of the pandemic induced recession, must be put towards building more just relations of mobility and dwelling, which will help us address both climate change and containment of the virus in a more just uh, way. So I'll, I'll end there. Um, and I know that's really just the beginning of um, a, a argument and points of discussion, but um, I will really welcome your questions. And um, I know we have um, help in sort of fielding those questions and someone who can explain how, where you can post those questions, but also feel free, there's my email address if anybody wants to get in touch with me afterwards. Um, thank you.